thank you everyone for being here um, to learn about the deep sea and especially about the topics of the deep sea humans and management. Uh, today I'm going to sort of step back and I'd like to talk to you building upon what both Sabine and Verena talked about to talk about how the deep sea is part of us. It is part of society, the earth, and together it essentially creates a functioning earth which we all benefit from. Um, just double checking that everybody can hear me okay? Yes. Thank you. So a lot of um, a lot of this might sort of try to answer this overall question of why should I, meaning any of us, care about the deep sea. Now you've seen some amazing footage of the diversity of animals and habitats that are present in the deep sea, but many people, including often myself, don't think about that diversity and instead just think about mud. Now this mud's actually doing a lot for us, but it doesn't necessarily come across as a habitat that's really integral to the earth society and uh, essentially the world's economy. So I'm going to essentially talk about exactly that today. I'm going to essentially give away my take-home points from the beginning and one of those points is that we all benefit from the deep sea and what goes on there. We often talk about the deep sea as the unknown, about this frontier of discovery and that is absolutely true but there's something else to that. We also know a lot about the deep sea and what we've learned about the deep sea is that we know enough that we need it to work. We need it to continue doing what it's doing for society if we want our planet to remain inhabitable. Now the deep sea is also unique from many of the other habitats that we frequently think about. First off, as you've heard, it is vast. Secondly, I'm gonna explain how it keeps our planet inhabitable. It has many habitats present. And then also the processes that occur there are in many ways different than those we often think about. They're slow sometimes almost impossible to measure slow, and yet if given enough time, which is what the deep sea provides it, they provide a significant benefit. I really loved the question about uh, whales using trenches to navigate with because it brings up this sort of critical component of the deep sea that all of the processes and the benefits that we get from the deep sea are a result of its interconnected nature, which also is really important to keep in, in contact, or sort of in your mind, if you think about how one might manage such a habitat in our own waters and globally. To give you the take home message at the beginning, the deep is part of our economy and our functioning planet and we need to keep that in mind as we decide as a humanity, how we're going to continue um, using the resources of this planet. Now each one of us has shown a different image that's essentially the same image. The world is deep. What I'd also like you to take from this is that the world is interconnected in many different ways and that's something that the deep sea provides a pathway for connection. Now as part of that connectivity as well as the diversity of habitats, there's a diversity of resources that are present within the deep sea. You'll hear a lot more about those tomorrow, but in addition, I'd like to mention a few of them so we can, uh, as a way to sort of um, inspire the conversation and thinking. Now, we can break these benefits into a variety of different, uh, different sort of categories. Some of those are things we get, material benefits. Some of that can be fisheries, nutrition, the ability to drive our cars through oil and gas, a variety of different mining resources, even jewelry, we've been disposing of waste in the deep sea for a long time. And then there's some new ideas, for example, using the deep sea to be able to essentially take on the current illnesses that are troubling humanity. There are also the location of cable runs. In fact, this, um, a lot of what we're doing right now is talking over submarine cables to be able to have a global economy across international boundaries. So those are things that we individually benefit from. However, there's also a lot of things we get from the deep sea, which are merely a function of process. To, I'm gonna talk about those in particular, but it's traps, trapped a lot of the carbon dioxide we've look, put into the atmosphere. It releases nutrients that are stored in the deep sea. So when they're brought back, it can provide food and oxygen for our planet. It essentially eats greenhouse gases through microbial processes in there, which again, adds to a functioning planet while providing mechanisms to put food into the deep sea that we can harvest directly. In addition, there's many processes that absorb different waste and even detoxify otherwise chemical compounds, or I should say, uh, dangerous chemical compounds. 
Now, the final one is even sort of harder to envision, but at the same time, incredibly important. And that's the benefits that society benefits or gets from this habitat. That can be education. It can stimulate an excitement of lifelong learning and science. It's a scientific treasure trove of discovery that we've heard about so far. It's taught us about the Earth's past, the Earth's present, and allow us to predict the Earth's future through studying the deep sea directly. And increasingly, it's even an area of tourism, where even if we all can't jump in our submarine and go down to the deep sea, we can now go along with explorers or other people as they go and explore corners of the Earth that we never knew about, and we can all be armchair explorers in our own simply by jumping on the internet. Now, I talked about it in these three sort of framework categories because this is a framework that is increasingly be, being used at management levels globally to compare what we get from different habitats. The first group, what we physically get from environment, is can be called a provisioning service, where a service is a benefit that we or a person or society gets from a habitat. An example of that is fish. We get fish to eat, and those are incredibly important for coastal and global communities as a source of nutrition. We also get process benefits, regulating surfaces, things that also directly benefit society, but through slightly more obscure patterns. For example, generating oxygen for us to breathe. And then we get cultural services, which can be things like tourism or non-material benefits. Now, if we look at the ocean globally and we look at the, the world globally, we can actually use these to come up with the value. And what's really powerful about this is to better understand the different uses of things. Now, what I found really surprising is looking into this and reading the literature on it is if we think about normally what an environment's worth, we think about the stuff we get from it, essentially those provisioning services. But on a global scale, only 7% of the worth of a habitat or what we value it as comes from things that we physically get. 97% of it, it goes on to these regula regulating services or even the cultural services, which far outweigh that provisioning service. If we look at the oceans alone, people have valued the ocean essentially being worth approximately $8 trillion. Personally, I think that's still quite a bit lower than, than it should be. But for illustration, only 0.3% of that $8 trillion actually are fishing. Now, I don't want that number to be taken in the wrong way. Coastal communities, fishing communities, and especially tropical communities absolutely rely on the nutrition that we get from the bounty of the oceans. However, put in context, that means 99.7% of the services we get from the global ocean actually comes from things like um, those regulating services or the cultural services. So all of them are important, but the balance of the overall magnitude of some of these uh, different services can really add up to a lot. The other part of this, again, and it's something I'll keep on talking about, is the interconnected nature of it all. If we benefit one, we can benefit another. There's spillover. However, the impacts on one also have negative impacts on the other ones. It's an interconnected habitat that connects the globe. You'll hear more about food from the deep sea. Um, but one thing about the deep sea is we actively globally fish in the deep sea. There are fish collections and active fisheries deeper than 2,000 meters water depth. As in part of that, we've heard about the longevity of deep sea uh, species and the fish that we harvest are no different. I've taken just a smattering over variety of travels and that includes um, things like this orange ruffy at the top. They can live to 120 years old. They don't even start to have babies until they're 20 years old. Patagonian toothfish, they don't start to have babies till they're seven to 10 years old and they can live to 50 to 70. And then this particular uh, fish from uh, some deep sea habitats, it again, doesn't even reach maturity to have young until 34 years old and live at some estimated age greater than 100, although we don't really know. So in other words, just like all you, the talks you've seen previously, there's very long lived and, uh, species within the deep sea. And some of those do make it onto our table and do fuel uh, us as people. In addition, uh, we've been higher, uh, harvesting oil and gas from the deep sea in, for many years. Um, there's more than, and these numbers are even out of date, they're bigger than they used to be. Um, globally, more than 37 uh, large oil and gas finds occur in ultra deep, which is uh, very, very deep. If you look on this map to the right here, this is the Gulf of Mexico. 
uh, in the California with this blue line, sorry, Gulf of Mexico, which is not in the Gulf of California. This is the Southern United States. You can see this blue line is the 200 meter depth contour or, and everything on the other side of that is deep sea uh, oil and gas extraction. And that's a current use. Globally, an additional future use is the access of methane hydrates. This is essentially, if you look to the right-hand side of your screen, you see this white ice, and that is methane, a potential uh, fuel source trapped in a cage of water. And there's been exploration on trying to figure out technology to harvest that ice for many years. It's my understanding that it's currently not quite ready to actually be used, but that may alter the future use of ocean resources if it becomes available. Marine genetic resources, also sometimes called natural products, uh, also sometimes called biopharmaceutical or biotechnological compounds, are essentially compounds or chemicals that are present in, often formed by biological processes, sometimes even microbes talking to each other that may have a medicinal or societal use. These are exciting. So for example, 50% of the cancer treatments were discovered in nature before they were synthesized in the lab. Now, there's also a lot of exploration that's possible as a result of these in the deep sea, uh, looking greater than 50 meters water depth. There's already been 600 identified and 75% of the deep sea products have some bioactivity that may have a societal use. So this is an exciting way that we may be able to help society through exploration of the different processes that are occurring within the deep sea. This is a map of mineral resources. I know we've talked about mineral, mineral resources, and so I won't um, dwell on it too much. And you'll also hear much, much more about it throughout the short course. But just to highlight this section of the world is a rich diversity of mineral resources, which also provides a rich diversity of habitats that also can add to the biodiversity. That biodiversity can provide a variety of different uh, resources, including novel biopharmaceutical, biotechnological uh, compounds as well as just biodiversity, which can excite the world around us through inspiration. Finally, waste disposal is largely illegal in the deep sea. However, it still occurs. This is an imagery taken not too long ago off the, the coast, off my coast, and you can see this uh, red, essentially red party cup that somehow made it deeper than a thousand meters, in addition to a variety of other waste that we constantly run across when we search the deep sea. It's illegal, but it's still occurring, and uh, one never knows the future of such things. I'm going to talk a little bit about methane because it ties in a process that becomes incredibly important when viewed on a global scale. And this is one of the things the ocean, and particularly the microbes in the ocean, do to keep the planet inhabitable. So we talked about methane as a potential vast energy source, not currently technologically harvestable, but a potential future. That's not an easy answer. It's not an answer to our uh, global energy process. It is not a sustainable energy use, but it is a potential energy source. Methane is also an incredible greenhouse gas. It's about 25 times as efficient at warming our atmosphere at CO2, and there are vast gigaton concentrations of it within the deep sea. However, microbes, as it is released into the deep sea, actually eat that methane. And I kind of like to think about those microbes taking and putting a pin back in a grenade that's not going to get up into the atmosphere. And it helps keep our atmosphere inhabitable so we can continue to live. Now, Verena also mentioned about how uh, chemosynthesis is increasingly being appreciated as a potential fuel for the bio biology within the deep sea. And these habitats that release methane, which include both habitats known as methane seeps, which is in images of here, as well as many hydrothermal vents, uh, also provide a fuel to the deep sea. And science, and this is at the uh, sort of the, the feathered edge of what we're learning, is beginning to believe that is maybe a significant proportion of all of the energy that's going into the deep sea. Now, I thought I'd just show you an image of another aspect of that, because when we're talking about uh, methane in a greenhouse gas, it does another thing. Now, this rock was actually formed as a byproduct of microbes. You can see uh, a little bit of those microbes and those white bits off to the side eating that methane. And when they eat that methane, what they do is they create rock sort of by accident. And this is an image of all of that rock at a habitat that's about, or I should say, it is almost exactly at a thousand meters deep. When you look at this, you can see fish, you can see mushroom corals, you can see a lot of biology and biodiversity that would not be there if we were just looking at a muddy seafloor. So in other words, habitats that consume these 
this chemical energy that's coming out of the seafloor can also create rock and further add to the biodiversity of the planet. The process of water through moving through the deep ocean is really an exciting process. And it's exciting because it helps the, it does one of the things that the deep sea does that's really hard to measure. Now, water moves from a variety of different habitats, but the majority of the water starts way up in the North Atlantic and it moves all the way throughout the ocean basin. This is called the global, global conveyor belt, but the water that's at the surface in the North Atlantic leaves the surface, is cut off from the atmosphere, and essentially takes what I like to call the long dark of the deep sea. This slow water movement throughout the oceans takes about a thousand years. And through that process, does an additional important uh, function for us on the planet. Now this comes into sort of two things. First off, we're talking about a thousand year time scales. As that water is moving all the way throughout the ocean, as soon as it departs the ocean surface, phytoplankton, essentially the grass of the ocean, falls down, sinks through it. And microbial processes and animal processes, both at the seafloor and in the water column, are slowly releasing nutrients fr from it and also removing oxygen from it. Now, this fact that it takes a thousand years mean it, means when it comes back to the surface, it is rich in nutrients that can then fuel phytoplankton, which does two things. One, it fuels fish on the surface globally, and it also produces a lot of oxygen because phytoplankton produce oxygen. And this, if you tried, if you went out and you actually tried to measure how quickly this was happening at any one point along its path, it's an almost immeasurably slow rate. Even with the best science we have and the best tool and the brilliant minds that try to do this, it's almost too slow. But if you give it a thousand years, this integrated activity results in a real societal benefit. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of all of the carbon dioxide that we, as a result of fossil fuel burning, have put in an atmosphere, which is what this figure shows within the atmosphere, a third of that to a quarter of that has already been absorbed within the deep sea, and it's trapped as a result of how long it takes that slow process of water moving throughout the deep sea. If we didn't have that, global climate change would be happening at a much faster rate than it already is. When the deep water comes to the surface, it fuels those phytoplankton, that grass of the sea, that provides fuel, food for fisheries globally. It also provides somewhere between a quarter and half of the oxygen. Half of the oxygen in our atmosphere actually comes, with the, comes from the ocean, and a lot of that is fueled by deep sea nutrients brought to the surface. And that provides food, essentially oxygen, whether you live at the coast, on an island, or in the middle of a landlocked state. So all of these processes are immeasurably slow, but if given enough, enough time, not perturbed, they essentially keep the planet functioning, or another word for functioning is working to whatever extent it is currently. Now one of my favorite things from the deep sea is the essentially the inspiration that can come from habitats. This is a colleague and a friend of mine, Lily Simonson's artwork inspired by Yeti crabs. Many artists, many TV shows, many documentaries are inspired by an absolutely mind-boggling oddities that occur in the deep sea, many of which would not uh, be known. And this links to that cultural aspect of it. This can excite people about a habitat they've never known. There's a whole field of research on environmental, aesthetic, as, yeah, environmental aesthetics that essentially tries to quantify how important habitats like this can be to society. One thing I like is it really fuels the imagination. People really love to know that there's something out there that we don't know. That something out there that we don't know can be as close as a 10 kilometer drive off a coast. It can even be closer to that in other parts of the world. But this knowledge that there's unknown, and in many cases the idea that there's an unknown that we have not yet disturbed, can be a powerful motivator for the appreciation of the natural world around us. Now, with that idea of connectivity and the long-lasting nature of how essentially old organisms get, there's also this idea that's sort of different from land and that things take a very long time to happen. We're talking about storing CO2 out of our atmosphere that's going to last for a thousand years. At the same time, much of that is biological process that do that and biological impacts on the deep sea are not short processes. Sabine showed an essentially a map or sorry, not a map, an image of a trawl scar that was on the seafloor that was there for 26 years. In many ways, rather than think of a biological impact on the deep sea, we need to think of biological impacts much like that trawl scar. 
it has to be thought of as mining, even if it's just the removal of a biological process, because it may not come back, or if it does, it may take tens, hundreds, or even thousands of years to repopulate to its current level. This is a picture of some long-lived uh, bubblegum coral. The other aspect of all of these is if we go through, and I've only touched on a few of the different things that society, that we all benefit from habitats, this is a map or essentially a figure that shows a variety of different ones that I haven't talked about. They are also interconnected. Each one of these, be they regulating, provisioning, supporting, in other words, processes or direct benefits, I've drawn lines, or I should say my colleagues and I have drawn lines connecting all of them together. And what we find is it's an interconnected web of benefits, which means one can, doing one or benefiting one can have ramifications throughout the impact, throughout the ecosystem, throughout the web of benefits we get. And as I showed in the previous slide, many of those can also have long lasting impacts on a variety of different benefits that society gets. This is a different framework than we often need to do when we're thinking about management of resources in other habitats. So a colleague of mine often talks about coastal ecosystems as a peopled seascape. The comp and that term is to essentially invoke this idea that the ocean and society are not a separate entity. I think that's very critical when we think about all habitats. And I hope what I've started to present is this picture that the deep sea is part of society and the peopled seascape is the global ocean, whether we're talking about a 4,000 meter deep a habitat of miraculous mud, a hydrothermal vent, or a variety of different habitats like these coral gardens we find. What we get from the deep sea is an inhabitable planet. It keeps greenhouse gases out of our atmosphere. We get food for our tables. Uh, we get that not only from the harvest it directly, but we also get it from the process of nutrients being released through the degradation of phytoplankton getting brought up to the surface over large oceanographic phenomenons. It's currently providing a variety of energy resources and in the future we're going to be asked about whether or not we want to explore and expand those energy resources. The nutrients released also give us air to breathe and it also has potential as a future solutions to many of society's problems and especially those that can be around illness or long-standing questions that novel compounds may be able to help us uh, to combat. Overall, the impacts are long lasting and they impact each other. So I like to say that the decisions we make will outlast us. These are hundred year decisions when we make about management of the deep sea. And in many cases, some of them will even outlast our children. <laughs>